nature on online. And I realized that I needed a series. And if I was going to write a series, then I realized, well, I need to be able to write something that I'm not going to get bored of. Mm -hmm. And so I had created or concocted a concept that would allow me to do things both on Earth, in near Earth orbit, and then far reaches. And that was, they ended up being seven books, each of those series. But going back specifically to Bethany Ann, I felt more about doing a female protagonist versus a male because I didn't want to write this testosterone laden, you know, grunting guy. And so I, I, I built it female for that purpose right there. But then again, I also was uh, attracted to uh, whip, strong women. Now, this is back in, you know, the 20, late 2015. So while strong women were obviously a thing, they weren't nearly as over the top as it is, you know, now in society. Mm -hmm. And so with Bethany Ann, you know, a couple of things that are, are relevant. One of them is she has a really a penchant for cheese, right? She and, sure that, does. <laughs> and that comes from my wife. And, uh, you know, if you've read the three, you might have read in the back in the author notes, I, I put this thing, you know, it's like anything I've learned about shoes, women's shoes comes from my wife. And at that time, she would have me get up in the morning because I work from home and sh she'd be like, what do you think of this pair of shoes? What do you think about that pair of shoes? I have no idea why she thought it was relevant to ask me my opinion, because I'm like, I don't, I just, I don't work that way. Right. And she can, you know, and so there was that situation. And so, you know, I, I just felt that. Bethany Ann would be a more caring individual. And I thought it sh she should have two defining characteristics and one fun one. And that, that trilogy, the trinity of, of properties comes from actually Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs talked about it back when he introduced the iPhone. And if you go back and watch that, you're going to say, it's a web browser, it's a phone, it's an iPad, it's a web browser. And so when I delved more into that, he believed that Oftentimes, you could only capture three essences of a project or a product. And I felt that was really kind of relevant to what I was doing at the time because I was seeking everything to try to figure out how do you build a compelling character? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't read a book. It's the action's nice, but I read it for the characters. And so that was it. It's like, you know, she is about family, whether it's real family or extended, you know, created family. Right. She's about justice. And she's about Coca-Cola because I was a, I'm a big Coke fan versus Pepsi. And so that is really kind of the genesis of what's going on there. And then I happen to like paranormal vampires. I happen to like sci-fi. And so I was trying to find a way to concoct, to bring all of these and meld all of these different genres that I had interest in and the off chance that it became popular. I was going to have to keep writing this. So that was, um, that was one thing that was really interesting too, is the genesis of, the vampire is a brand new take on it because I kind of like, okay, here's a vampire story. But then, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, vampires. Uh, those that are listening, you don't get to see John's face when he's rolling his eyes like left and right. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like I said, because I read a lot, you know, so I guess based upon your definition, I, I definitely qualify as a, oh, yes. a whale prime, you know. <laughs> we, I think if you go whale, you go like Kraken. <laughs> I guess I'm Kraken. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, but then after I got in and found out what happened, you know, once you get into it, find out what happens, how she becomes that way. And then the delineation between the vampire trope that I'm so overrun on and mm -hmm. this new one then became like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then you have a sense of justice, which makes sense. And she's such a likable character, you know, even though she is, I, mean, I love also her her sense of propriety with her language, you know. And at the at the start of each book, having to have that disclaimer, you know. Yes. So what John is obliquely referencing at the moment is that Bethany Ann curses a lot, and the pro, the challenge it has been challenging for those new authors out there. If you care to get a little salty with your language, expect a lot of pushback. Expect your sales, honestly, not to be as high as it could be if you would keep it a lot cleaner. I, however, did not because I find cursing often funny. I just find it funny. And so for me to do that, and, and so I started this premise saying, you know, she, she's not going to allow the same curse word over and over again. That's just lazy. And I was giving all, honestly, what I was doing is creating justification for allowing me to say all these stupid things. And um, a lot of people at the time, I remember the fans were asking me, uh, you know, how does he come up with all of these different curse words? And I, I'd never told them for the longest time. And finally, I admitted that there was like this curse-o-matic 
online where you could just click a button and it would come up with these stupid curse words. And then it got so bad that I would take this one from that choice and that one because, you know, I was, it was rerunning their own self and it was duplicating stuff. And so, yeah, that's, I appreciate that oblique reference, but uh, it, it, it was a consternation among some of the people. Um, one person ended up saying uh, on something I was reading, and it wasn't specifically about my book, but it's just in general, if I see one F-bomb, I'm out of here. So that was like, all right. I just put that as the very first word of the next book, and it was like top 30 in the store. I'm like, it, <laughs> now, mind you, that wasn't book one, so right. it had some way to go. But, you know, I was a real, I had a real attitude, let's just say that. Now, I've cursed so much in the last five years. Now I'm actually bored with, you know, just <laughs> cursing at all. Yeah. I mean, not to justify cursing, because yes. with our Rise to Future series, we're, we're pretty rigid on the use of profanity, lack thereof. But... What you've done with it, though, because it's not the the standard old f bombs, and so it's like you're having fun with it. So it ha it's not this. It doesn't come across like someone whose language pops out at a hundred words. Yeah, it's, it's it's you know similar to whenever um, stand up comedians used to curse just to to get to get a rise, know, right? To get a rise, to get a reaction. It's not intended that way. Mm -mm. Uh, I was now, mind you, if you do it, you're going to get people saying that's why you're doing it. But in today's society, I'm like, eight-year-olds say it. So I don't – why? Because <laughs> yeah, they've read your books too much. I, I, I have had people actually go, like, you know, you've been cursing more often, sweetheart. And, then, and they're like, uh. Yeah. So um, – but that's, I think, possibly some of the least of our societal problems. But anyway, that's not the subject of this, of this interview, so we shall, we shall move on. <laughs> so one thing on – when I, when I went over and looked at your, your website for LMBPN, other than one feral chipmunk on the cover art, they were all, uh, all the personas were, were female, at least in what I saw there. Is there some particular, I mean, I was, I have not, no problem either way on that, but it just, it just, it really st struck me as a, uh, as a definite factor. Well, there's, and I didn't yeah, see so any F in the LMBPN, so I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a couple, there's two or three things that are, we're, one of them is absolutely you're seeing a, a snippet in time. Right. Another one is uh, because more than likely if you went to the homepage, what you see at the top is kind of like what books are coming out this week. You know, LMBPN is a prolific publisher. Unlike, you know, a lot of publishers, those that you even hear that are big names that have been, you know, 50 or 30 to 40, 50 years, they do at most in any of their sci-fi urban fantasy imprints, 60 books a year. 80 books, maybe a year. Mm -hmm. LMBPN does 250 to 300 books a year. So we do anywhere, depending on if we're doing re-releases, box sets, you know, new, you know, front list books, uh, publishing some, you know, additional books, any of those things, we often have anywhere from four to seven or eight titles a week coming out. Wow. Now, it also just so happens that two or three of our most prolific authors are also female. So their characters almost invariably are female. Sure. <laughs> um, my own characters lean, tend to be lean 60, 40. Now I, I have done some male characters. Brownstone is one of the real popular characters that I've done a couple characters, but also what you're going to find a fair amount of times in male driven, like sci-fi, you'll see ships. You won't actually see the male character on the cover. Now, from a publishing perspective, and for those that knew authors, if you want to find out which character is going to sell better, females are going to, generally speaking, sell better. You have a, a, a higher propensity of female readers, and that includes in what you would think would be strictly male genres, except for lit RPG. Um, and so you, you have this ability to sell easier with female characters. I didn't know that in the beginning. That wasn't my original intention. But I do know that uh, a lot, when I explain that to some of my collaborators, whom are already female, it tends to, there you go. I get it. Wow. That was interesting, but I just, it just really, it's, it's not common to see that. So that was just, that was going to be one question. I was really fascinated to find out what it was that you, um, that you did that. So now you came up with however many years ago, which we'll talk about the 20 books to 50 K. Um, so what's, what sparked that? Cause I'm very interested in that because, with Writers of the Future, the whole purpose there is to help aspiring writers um, to mm -hmm. get that, that initial break and artists. So it seems like 20 books to 50K is also a similar type of a, of a uh, mindset to be able to help writers 
on the business side of things. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I released my first, second, and third book in November of 2015. Now, the first book, it took me probably six to eight weeks to write. So the second one was like nine days, and the next one after that was like 11 days. And it, what happened was NaNoWriMo happened in November. So um, I had my fourth book in December, my fifth book in January, and I was making more than $10,000 a month in January. And so at that time, if you were in the author area, uh, the indie author specifically arena, there was a lot of, you know, woe is me type of attitude. And I was on a website at the time called Keyboards. And uh, with going what's going on, I was, I was seeking to find out other people and what's in I was getting a lot of pushback, mm -hmm. people going, oh, this can't be true. This is whatever. And I was also teaching, if you will, my fans what it meant to be an indie author. I was talking about it in my author notes. And so at that time, four to five, tip, technically five of my, my fans were really interested. And I said, you know what? I had just gone down to Cabo a couple of months before. And in my mind, 20 books to 50K was how many books I would have to write to make 50 thousand a year consistently. And I was, you know, I had just put out at the time my second book and I was making seven and a half dollars on average a day. If you 20 times seven and a half gets you 54,000. So that's kind of where the 20 books to 50 K from. So when I was helping my fans, I'm like, you know what, we need to take this conversation out of the Facebook page related to the books, the stories. Let me go create another Facebook page and we'll all talk there. And so because of that, I just, I named it branded it 20 books to 50K based on my own desire, right? Mm -hmm. When I went to um, a particular indie author event in February of 2016, so I'm three and a half months into this, um, there was a lot of talk there. And those fans, a lot of them had started uh, releasing their own books because we all hit the ground running. Many of them uh, would do it. And at the time, it was four of them. And all of them had introduced themselves into the top 10,000 of the store, which was kind of unheard of at the time. And so by then I was, you know, I'm writing every single day. I'm usually working 20 to 22 hours a day on all of this. And I could say I had perhaps a slightly short temper and I, uh, I just kind of laid down the gauntlet. You know, I was tired of the, of the flack I was getting and I just wanted to talk business. I wasn't going to talk how to write. It wasn't relevant to me. So I threw down the gauntlet and I said, here, Boom, 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 boom. Here are the results of what I'm doing. If you care to talk about this anymore, join me on 20 books to 50K. We'll help you over there. And there was, I had four people. I figured I'd get four more and I personally could help eight people. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready. It was the weekend of uh, this event that was in Austin at the time. And <laughs> I wasn't expecting to get 80 in the first weekend. And so all of a sudden I'm overwhelmed. And I reached out to quite a few people who were at that event. And um, Shawnee, John, and Dave is their event. And I, I wish I could remember what they called it, but it's escaping me at the moment. And, you know, uh, we had everyone from Mark Lefebvre of Kobo was there mm -hmm. at that time and, and quite a few other draft to digital. And so they, they jumped in to help foster this community that, that I had built. And so a lot of my fans and uh, my collaborators and things were, help, were who would become vocabulary collaborators jumped in to help me as well. And we started this. And then now it has since grown since uh, 2016 to like 54,000, 55,000 people. So how many people attend when you have your annual conference in Las Vegas? Um, this COVID being what it is, we probably had about 12 to 1500. Um, it was expected pre-COVID to be around 2000 to 2500. And so we, we kind of take over the event. It's a nonprofit event. It's the money, the cost of doing the, the tickets is about as low as we can go and still cover everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I myself nor Ellen BPM receive any income whatsoever from this. Um, we spend a fair amount of income each month, yeah. uh, each year. But in that, and that is headed up by Craig Martell. Got it. So now when we, I think some of my uh, staff met you originally last year at two years ago. I'm oh, sorry, we didn't do anything last year. Okay, so two years ago at um, WordFire. Yes, with Kevin Jane. It was at the Superstars event. Superstars, right. With right. Kevin G. Anderson. And um, they came back talking about you. Wow, this is a great guy. You got to read his stuff here. And I was like, oh, gosh, more stuff to read, you know? <laughs> and so finally, then when we when we finally scheduled, okay, good, I'm, I'm going to read his stuff. And then it just became like, oh, my gosh, I had so much fun. It's 
there's enough stuff that's the, the heavy super drama stuff that goes on in just regular life. I don't need that. I don't need to escape to that to be able to get some other take on super duper heavy drama. So it's mm -hmm. just a lot. Yeah, of really. <laughs> just, just and that's, I mean, really, honestly, that is my intent. While there is an underlying message occasionally, there absolutely is pushing. Um, it, the reality is, I don't, I don't read to get more drama. I've got plenty of that for sure. Yeah. So, you know, but just the, um, I really like your underlying thing, which is, it's not like ostentatious, but just, it's just a, a sense of fairness and, and what's what's right and wrong. It's not country versus country. It's just, is this right or is this wrong? You know, and and Michael, who hasn't re-entered into the into the story yet, but in the first three, you know, it's, things are jockeying that it's you know something's obviously going to be happening as it grows more and more, and then you get little in, intuition about okay, something has obviously got to happen now with with the friend who's living in her head with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, you know, there's a couple of things to to mention to authors, um, and some of these you might have mentioned on the show. I apologize if I'm just reiterating this. One, don't name a character that's after yourself. I didn't actually name Michael. The I was going to ask about that. after me. Um, it was after Michael the Archangel because you'll see he's called Archangel in in the series. Yeah, is his you know title. That's what it was about. It wasn't until like two or three years. When a fan said, you know, that's a pretty significant size cojones for you to name a character after yourself. And I'm like, uh oh, I actually never intended that. Um, and the second one is always, you know, start your character names with a letter and then never use the same letter again for any primary character whatsoever. <laughs> Just Adam, Bob, Charles, David, <laughs> whatever it takes um, in order to keep yourself on track because I ended up duplicating. I got so confused in the beginning with character names. And with a series this long and this far reaching, it became difficult for me to remember who was who, especially if their names were even remotely similar. Yeah. So for what it's worth. Okay, that's that's a, a good tip there. And then the two name with Bethany Ann, I thought that was that was very uh adventurous too. She's not just a name, she's Bethany Ann. But then she has no last name. So that that works out. So she still got she has two names. <laughs> well, the thing is that my, my stepmother's name is Jo Lynn. And it's always confusing because I always assumed it was her first name. No, so it's her first name, middle name. But then other times it's people's only name, you know, their first name. What is two words? Mm -hmm. um, the other part of it is I couldn't stand having one more river, cult, you know, massive gun sound. I was like, no, I just want a generic name and let their what they do become who they are. Yeah. Which was great. She's like, that's in the end. Just you'd, the last thing you think of that she would be like some amazingly. Uh, effective beauty as well as lethal weapon, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the name of justice, you know? Yes. So that was, that was pretty, that was pretty clever on that. Well, thank you. So um, how familiar are you with writers of the future? I'm uh, familiar with it. Some, obviously I'm familiar with, um, you know, it, what was going on in the background, but a lot of the people that I've met since I was in the industry, now I'm not from this industry whatsoever. I had no background I didn't know any other writers. Um, I've since met and or befriended like Kevin J. Anderson and Mark Lefebvre and others that really speak highly of the organization and, and how it supports science fiction. Yeah, it was um, it was actually created in, in 83 by Owen Hubbard, and he had had a long history in the 30s and 40s as a, as a pulp writer. And he'd helped a lot of aspiring writers back then. You know, a lot of the earlier Golden Age authors, he had actually helped out with and he was also um he was the president of the uh fiction guild in new york and he was also um he'd written a lot of articles for writing magazines writers digest and, and whatnot back then and those are essays that are still used today in the in the writing workshop yeah that's that's the whole thing of it is to be able to provide that that leg up for the aspiring writer it started off and we had you know, like yourself it started humble beginnings with you know, algis budras i don't know if you know ever heard of that that name but he was a very famous uh, editor at the time so he became the first coordinating judge and he brought in his other friends and other uh, famous writers at the time so you've got you know Anne McCaffrey Todd is now is, is one of the uh, judges I've met but, both of them yeah so they were both judges and we've got Kevin Anderson co-writes the Doom books with um, mm -hmm. uh, Brian Herbert but 
Uh, his father, Frank Herbert, was one of the first judges. So we have that type of, uh, of a history with the uh, writing contest and similarly with the illustrating contest with major names in, in illustration back then. And it just continues on because it's, it's blind judging that everybody has uh, a fair shot at, at winning the contest. The judges only see the story or the art. They have no idea if it's male, female, nationality, or anything. Can we, can we talk about that just for a minute? Because maybe it's politically incorrect for me to say, but unfortunately, there are both two things in the that I, I do not believe writers of the future, as you say, the, the blind part of this. But there are a lot of politics in a lot of organizations out there. And I, I've seen and watched uh, and got embroiled in some of them myself. And so I, I have a lot of respect for double blind judging or blind judging mm -hmm. as you're doing and a lot of respect for the level of experience the professionals bring uh, to, to what's going on because, you know, not, you know, I, I'm going across multiple genres here. We know about the implosion of the romance writers situation. We understand, and there are a couple of others that, you know, I, I won't name, but some of their most storied individuals actually don't sell at all. It was politically motivated. And, and I mean, inwardly, not Republican, right. Democrat. I mean, inwardly sure. politically motivated. And yet, you know, we, you and I have discussed um, previously about the quality of where some of the winners of Writers of the Future and where they've gone. And as a publisher now, you know, kind of matured into that role, you know, I understand what it means to have people be willing to say, hey, whoever wins, give them my card. If it, if it wins with you guys, give them my card. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's quite a lot of accolade right there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Rise of the Future is a market. We are going to have stories that will be appropriate for middle school on up. And we, we're very transparent about that. So, um, whereas I love Bethany are and you dearly, she would not a, see, a highly <laughs> I love her dearly. She would not find a home. <laughs> Writers of the future. <laughs> we're we're going to have to put the evil brother to writers of the future. Writers of the purient future. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so, and it's it's interesting how it works also with Rise of the Future too, because people win strictly based upon the merit of their work. Yes. And uh, same goes with the illustration as well. And so some people are really lovely people when you get to meet them. And some people are less than lovely people, but they're chosen and they're flown out to Hollywood based upon the fact they won the contest, you know, and for the most part, it works out really, really well. And we've got, um, people have gone on to be very, very successful. We've had, you know, some instances where their personality was less than, you know, appropriate, like, you know, nobody raised them with the basic manners of, of saying thank you when someone does something nice for you, but mm -hmm. that's fine. That's not why they won. They didn't win because of manners. So if anything, that's actually, helped even more the whole process of writers of the future because there are no favorites it's just personality wise it's just straight is it a good story is it good art mm -hmm. and um we have found that the people that are that are appreciative tend to do better in life because um if a publisher or an editor or anybody you know in a professional capacity has to work with you if you have a choice between working with someone who's fun to work with and someone who isn't the quality of work can be really great, but just that one extra factor makes a difference on somebody moving on their on their career. At least that's what I found. Well, no, no. Well, I mean, one of the things I don't remember when what we spoke about um, the Robin Cutler who helped build Ingram Spark for Ingram, which is a massive company. If you don't know who they are, they're basically the company that got Amazon started mm -hmm. in the book publishing and still supports them to this day. And in so, so they went to a POD and they, they tapped Robin Cutler from Amazon, hired her away. Well, she retired, right? Quote, quote, retired. Well, on the second day of her retirement, I ended up talking her into hiring her over to bring into LMBPN Publishing. And she and I have had this conversation. Neither, I'm, I'm 50, some years old. <laughs> <laughs> and, re, and Robin is retirement and this has retired. I'm not claiming I know what her issue is. I'm just merely saying she said she's retiring. And so both of them, of us have talked about it and while we are considered a small you know small trade type organization just from our sales even though it's multiple seven figures you know you have to pretty much be 50 or 100 million become before you become medium press in this world mm -hmm. um and so both of us are like our life's too short to deal with jerks 
we don't care. I don't care how good your book is. We will let you go yeah. if you're a jerk. So if you're a jerk, don't even apply because you're going to waste both of our time. Yeah, that's, that's a definite, um, that, that bears out what I was saying there. It's just, it's mm -hmm. so true. There's a lot of great talent out there. And a lot of great yes. talent has a great personality. So if you have a choice. Yeah, let's, let's once again, you, you, you touch on all of these fun things to chit chat about. Yeah. There's a lot of great talent out there. Just because there's a lot of great talent, don't think you can't be one of them. And at the same time, recognize there's a lot of great talent That's out right. there. <laughs> and it's worldwide now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's we pull writers from around the world. Our artists, I have an artist that we've used for you know multiple years who lives in Transylvania. The Transylvania. I wow, mean, I don't how, know cool how cool is that? Is. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We got winners this year from nine countries in Rise of in Illustrated the Future. Nine countries we got winners from this year. What are they? America. Okay, we have eight more. <laughs> yes, we do have winners from the United States, but <laughs> but UK, Australia, South Africa, uh, Portugal, Spain. I mean, it was just there's this. I don't remember this, and I just remember the line at the bottom said eight or nine. So I went, okay, good. Eight others plus. Yeah, United no, States. it's it's amazing, and you know. To be, if you're in the genre of science fiction, there are more science fiction readers in China than all of the United States. Oh, it's crazy. And just this podcast, when this goes out, Russia, I have, there's so many listeners in Russia as well as China. It's like throughout Asia and, and Europe. Oh, let's get shout out to Russia, Lit RPG. Where was it started? Russia, you know. Yeah. You know, so it's. I was, I was surprised the first time I had the breakdown of, of who all listens to the podcast. Because as I said, it's about a million listeners that we have on each episode. And then getting the breakdown, because it's about 110 countries now that, that listen. And it's just, um, it's just crazy how universal science fiction and fantasy are, but also English. You know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I realize that you're into publishing all the different languages, too. So I imagine that, I mm -hmm. assume that means translations, not just publishing. Correct. Yeah, we, we have um, integrated translation. We don't outsource our translation to other companies. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's really good on that. So anyway, the thing with, with Writers of the Future is providing that, that helping hand. And it's grown some the word of mouth. We, we did that online writing workshop that's free. We've got over 6,000 people that have taken or are taking that one. Uh, we have the, um, the forum, which usually the last several years is, is won the uh, best forum award on, on a popular reader's poll. And then we've got um, the blog. And so it's just in the book itself routinely wins each year's anthology. You, you routinely wins two or three book awards plus, you know, the sales of it, which, uh, which is always great for the, for the winners to be able to put that in there. And it's interesting now too, that because it is now acknowledged as there's there's no back back scene or back door entry into the into the contest, but every other week I see someone with a press release saying I was an honorable mention in the Writers of the Future, you know, um, this this week's uh, cover uh, article Karen Joy Fowler on Publishers Weekly she's got the the cover of the magazine and it says in there she 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 got her start she won Owen Hubbard Writers of the Future back in Volume One you know so it's it, it's pretty cool how it's just because we haven't changed, we, we kept true to the, the original prime purpose that, that Owen Hubbard created it with. And it just, it's done as well. You know, even when it went through the, some of the various changes that have occurred in science fiction, fantasy, the last decade or so, the various political aspects of it. And we just didn't get into that stuff at all. We don't take sides. We're just straight. Our purpose is to support the aspiring writer and artist. And we just stay with that, you know, and it's, um, yeah, you have a beacon. You have one particular goal in mind. That's the light that you go towards. Yeah. And so it's um, when that particular evolution was happening in science fiction and fantasy tried to pull us into it. We just, I stayed clear. I said, I'm not going to play that game. Didn't get into mm -hmm. it. And so the backlash on them was way worse than anything on us, saying that uh, Rise of the Future has done more for science fiction and fantasy than you could ever hope to. So back off, guys. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So. On um, when we spoke on on our little pre-interview, you talked about uh, writing beats, and mm -hmm. so if you can talk a bit about what writing beats is and what's its value, and then beats versus pantser. 
So most people understand that you write it, what pantsing is. And if you don't, then it's writing by the seat of your pants. I mean, that's exactly it. You start, you know, you go, ah, you know, John was walking down the hallway and he heard, you know, you're just writing. Yeah. <clears throat> then you have the opposite of that is like a high heavy duty outline. You know exactly what's going to go on in every little twist and turn. Somewhere in between those two are beats. So and it's the name is time to take him from the beating of your heart. Good dunk, good dunk. And every major kadunk is something that happened. Like it's just the, the genesis, a sentence or two about what is that scene. Bethany Ann has to go to the bank and withdraw some money and something happens. And then that's a whole chapter. You know, what something happened in this particular instance is somebody tried to rob a bank while she was inside trying to get money and it pissed her off and she took care of stuff. <laughs> it, it, a lot of stuff actually happens that way. Something happens and it pisses off Bethany Ann and she takes care of stuff. But within all of that, what those beats are is unique to every person. I like to say if you have 10 authors, there's 11 ways to write this story. You know, each author is going to have a unique way and there will be another one. You know, there's probably the right one that none of us got. Right. And so, you know, I'm very objectively uh, subjective about how what is correct. And the answer is it's always, as people I'm sure have said, it's whatever works for you. You know, people would like to know what's the the bullet, I was like, I can tell you exactly what the special bullet is to write so long as you write exactly like me. If you don't write exactly like me, my my advice is going to have varying degrees of support. Right. And it doesn't mean that I'm right or wrong. It just means that you don't your brain doesn't operate the same way mine does, which is fantastic. Otherwise, we wouldn't have unique stories that we do. Right. So those, you know, for me, beats would be uh, if you take a spreadsheet. On the left-hand side, you would write major, mini, what I would consider mini arcs. You know, Bethany Ann has to go and get the money out of this bank in another country. Bethany Ann has to accomplish getting this, the, the UFO over here to this place. Bethany Ann has to accomplish this. And you have the whole, you know, beat of the book, which is she has to defeat XYZ. And for each, now I'm a, my background is programming. So for me to actually go A, B, C, D is, is, something I've you know, done a lot in my life. And so I would just write these and I'd say, okay, if she's going to have to do that, well, she has to get on the train. She has to go to the bank. Something has to happen in the bank. And then she comes back home and that's four beats. That's the whole quote scene, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, those four beats are probably going to be three, three and a half chapters. But then I go to the next one. And so for a 75,000 word book, I would typically have anywhere from 55 to 75 little cells, spreadsheet cells. And then I would take these ones. And remember on the left-hand side was each arc, right? not in order. But so now, because I, I do multiple, I do head hopping in those books. And it, it, it's another thing that a lot of fans are not terribly happy with, but they dealt. And so I would then take those beats and I would put them in chronicolo chronological order top, you know, to bottom. And I'd put that into Scrivener and I would just, each one of those, I'd break them into chapters. And then I just start writing it at the top and I would write each scene as I went through. So I, you never find me going back and coming forward. My brain didn't operate that way. I, I'm fine going absolutely down. That's what I've been taught. And so I would go all the way through. And what that allowed me to do is I would end up having just in time, you know, people checking my work. As I finished the first five chapters, I threw it to them. And there's a podcast on this in much more detail if you want to go find it somewhere. But um, so by the time I finished the book, Usually I would finish on a Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. They would have five to 10 chapters to finish reviewing and we would have it out by Friday because I wasn't waiting six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. I wasn't waiting any of that time to get this book out of. I'm impatient by personality. But what that has accomplished is even now as we quote matured into the full company we are, it is still four weeks from author turning the book to release. You get four weeks and that's one week of pre-order which means it's locked down. So we have three weeks and that's assuming book one, if book one doesn't need a, a, a beta review, it now is three weeks. So one week for the editors, one week for the JIT, one week of pre-order and out. And it is phenomenal because our, our editing teams can do multiple millions of words a month, our crew can, and our just in time go through all of the books. And so it's not just an editor, but the editor cleans it up. Every human being makes mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons if you have only a single editor, they'll often do two or three passes. Pass number one, stick it in the thing so it's fresh again, look at number two weeks later. I'm not gonna do that. Editor gets it one pass. Once they're done, it goes to like 
anywhere from four to eight readers. Now I've noticed over time that what happens with readers is some people see the same mistake. They can see them. And so sometimes you'll see, let's say it's eight people, then typically four people will get the chunk of them. Two people will find you know, half of what they found and maybe a couple others. And two individuals in that eight will find like five mistakes. But invariably, there'll be the five mistakes none of the others have ever found. Wow. And it, it's really a, an interesting insight into the mind of readers of what they will find. The challenge is, we, we thought one time, well, great, let's go to 12 readers. Let's go to 14 readers. We'll catch them all. Well, no, what happens is you can't actually manage that many readers at one time. And so you carry it back down to anywhere from four to eight is, is for us, mm -hmm. a sweet spot. Wow. That, that's, um, that's very cool on that. With, um, you were talking earlier about you know, having 10 authors and you have 11 ways of writing something. Mm -hmm. At Writers to Future, when we have our workshop, and you probably experienced that also on your uh, uh, 20 bucks to 50K, is quite often you'll have a couple judges, like the, 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 the main judges teaching the workshop, you see there are two or three. They're constantly disagreeing with each other. Oh, yeah. You know, that's like, which is really good for the writers because there's not like, this is how you write. You know, Larry Niven does a whole different way than Tim Powers, which is totally different than Kevin Anderson because Kevin will, will pump, he, first of all, he dictates everything mm -hmm. and then he'll do what, half a, half a dozen books a year, whereas Tim Powers will do one book in a year. He does amazing, painstaking research into it. Mm -hmm. um, Larry Niven has a whole thing on science and you know, so you've got these different people that have, well, this is how I do mine. So you can actually pick and choose what works for you and not like this is how you do it. Same thing with the illustrators too. Well, so here's the, the all right. So like anything, authors are human beings. And a lot of times authors like to be right. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is, no, you're not. And here's part of the reason why. If you'd like to take an answer, one first, your answer is subjective. It's personality based. So let's go back and say, where is an objective way to measure the success of a book? Let me ask that. And the only way I come up with at the moment is money. That's the only objective measure. The problem with going to money as the answer is the bifurcation of the readership is so big that there's no answer, period. Because one book, let's go with, um, oh, this is going to be a horrible one for writers of the future, Fifty Shades of Grey universally, universe, that book is considered a poorly written book that made $50 million. So which is it? Yeah, we can, we can <laughs> talk about Harry Potter too, because that's the favorite one that people like to talk about. It was poorly written, but yet. It, okay, so why? So what's the answer? Their answer is, if you're a liter, literati, right? And this is, now I'm going to get my soapbox, right? Because if you look at um, my first books, you're definitely going to say, hmm, on the questioning on it. But it engendered people to reread the series before the next book came out. So book three, they read one and two to read book three. And book four, they'd gone back and read one, two, and three to read book Why? You can't argue objectively that's not a well-written story. <laughs> if they're rereading it, it has touched them emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, you have to agree. Now, if you want literature, if you want... And then the, the blue paisleys on the wallpaper were done in such a way, but the little corner of the glue came off. That is a different experience. The readers who like that, and there are some, because I've had discussions with one. <laughs> with one? <laughs> one. It's all I could handle. It was a very long discussion. <laughs> but I couldn't understand it. Because myself, I just, I was bored to tears. And that's what you get in high school a lot of times. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the wonderful, it's, no, it's not wonderful. It's, it's a particular wonder for you, but for me as a reader, I hated it mm -hmm. because I didn't need you to fill in the details back in the 1800s. We have TV. I know what a lion is. I don't need to understand the flowing hair that comes off of the mane and the wind. Is it gla I don't need that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's like Pulp Fiction also versus the, the, uh, the, the Pulps versus the Slicks. Well, yeah. So in the slicks and everything you're talking about there, people wanted to become slick because they got paid better, right? Mm -hmm. No one remembers the people who wrote the slicks. That's right. You only remember the pulps because those are the ones that stood the test of time. Right. That's exactly right. And it's, um, I think that's, that's a really good point too, that people need to understand. Like you can go into, I mean, look at the stuff I had to read in high school. I really don't remember it, but I remember I used to, I saved my, my pennies and my nickels as a kid 
And Texaco used to have this thing where they would, um, when you fill up or get so many gallons, you could then buy books. They'd have books. And so I remember reading, you know, Jack London, you know, and just. All of the world. Yeah, exactly. I love that. And I love Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Those were my favorite. And I still remember them, even though I read them so long ago. They were great stories. And, um, you know, I don't remember the the hair on the mane of the cat, you know. <laughs> Weathering Heights. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not there. Now, once again, I'm not the target market, and I guess that's where I was going to. These, the the three authors you're speaking about earlier, they have different target markets. Mm -hmm. They should, if they don't understand the business, then they're not going to understand what I'm saying. Once you get into the business, you recognize that the different target markets are expecting different writing. So, in in within their target market, they are absolutely correct. Right. But outside of their target market, they're absolutely wrong. And so one of the reasons I feel like I exploded the way that I did is I wrote to an untapped market, you know, not nearly 50 states of gray untapped market, but it was enough to become a seven figure author yeah. in a year. <laughs> so it was something that, well, let's, let, let me clarify that statement real quick. I did not make seven figures my first year, but I was making six figures on the 12th month of my first year. So just. Okay, yeah, moment. let's not like get too out of hand here. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm up to nine figures in my eighth year. Yeah, yeah, no, oh man, dude, uh, it's it's a, a goal. Everyone should have a goal. Exactly. Um, imagine how much good you can do with nine figures. Universe, universe. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you Beth in the end. She's doing good, so let yeah, me do some yeah, good. Yeah, here. yeah. You know, a lot of people helping their fellow man. Someone named a baby after Beth in the end. Come on. Really? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yes. Yes. There's a young girl named Beth in the end. Okay. Good. So, um, so now you've got because we have both the writing contest and, and and the illustrating contest. How do you pick your illustrators? How do you, your cover artists? Or do you already is it a closed? It is point? not totally closed. Um, the challenge is that we go through a lot of art each and every month. We go through a lot of art and as a production company, and we are effectively an IP creation engine. You know, if you think of just LNBPN itself, we are very relatively very unique company in the way that we do things. So I realized if you treat people well, they'll want to stay with you. Mm -hmm. And each time we worked with an artist who was easy to work with, go back to not being a jerk, and they produced art that we wanted and we were able to afford them. And, you know, we worked well. I said, okay, uh, can you stick around if I give you six books a month? Can you deal with that? And would that be okay? And you have to understand artists are treated very poorly by indie authors, by and large. They will find, not all of them, I, I just merely to say that the bad experiences highly outweigh a lot of the good ones. Mm -hmm. And so when you, you know, you work with a company like LNBPN, we're not that picky. I mean, we're picky within reason, but we're not like, and can you change this? And her middle index finger is the wrong way. And by the way, we want four of the characters, which arguably is not a good choice. I know I just broke it to test something, but in general, you really only want one, maybe two characters, preferably one on the cover. And so I started quote unquote acquiring these artists would be like, yes, I'll get, I'll let you block up my time because now they don't have to sell. They know that they're going to be paid. They're going to be paid very quickly, you know, which is honestly one of the best things you can do. And they're, you know, they're going to be there for us. And so um, we've acquired four or five different artists to help us with the amount of work we do each and every month. And they're not exclusive to us. So all of them will take on other clients. Just be aware that their availability might be June of next year. Mm -hmm. you know so just of what's going on so but we are testing because occasionally um we will get new needs and we're like oh we need to recover the series and we need eight covers in the two months and at that point none of our existing people are going to be able to handle it we have them scheduled out significantly farther than that and we'll reach out to new ones good so that's something that i was just curious how that worked because we have 12 winners each year and they're all different types of art and some of them are just amazing cover artists and some of them are children's artists some of them have different goals you know for what they're gonna be able to do i just did one interview with uh our winner from turkey and she's going she's at usc now and so for her is gaming so she's working on and she found she loves working with other artists to help bring out the best in them so she's 
running projects now. She's a freshman in, in college, and she's running this. Which camp. USC? Oh, uni oh, University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. Okay, no, that's my wife's alma mater. So she is like, you know, she, we we assume. Oh, you must mean University of Southern California, and then Robin is like University of Southern Carolina or something. Oh. And we're like, what? <laughs> There's Sorry. another USC. USC has already been used. <laughs> Figure out something else. <laughs> No, but we love, I mean, if you're, and I'll just lay this out there for, for your people. I mean, we don't usually speak too much, but we do accept submissions. There is a little link at the very bottom of our page, and it's not really announced. Announcing it on something that's listened to a million times might be a bit much. <laughs> um, and then from the art side as well, you know, we do have internal people, uh, a lady by the name of Kelly O'Donnell, who deals with the artists. Now, I will, upon occasion, undertake uh, unique projects for an artist where I just like their work. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm In fact, I'm doing one right now with a guy by the name of Justin Smith. And I'm, I'm like, I, I did one book with him a year and a half ago. I liked his work. His, his pricing was way out of tune with what we would normally do. But we ended up selling that series on the strength of arguably just the cover and a paragraph. We sold the audio rights to it. And we're like, okay, we got to get this <laughs> puppy going. And so um, from time to time, I'll go outside just to kind of see what's going on and, to, and because I like to, you know, work with people. Yeah, well, Edgar Rice Burroughs did pretty good with Frank Frazetta. Uh, he, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. Trust me, I, I have a Frazetta. Uh, it's signed, but it's not numbered. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, Boris and, you know, yeah. Frazetta. Yes. So um, now when we also spoke, you talked about authors are dopamine pushers. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, can you talk about that and your, and how that maybe is as a senior consideration on, um, at least the type of fiction that you write? Absolutely. I was in Barnes and Noble back when we used to go there and just hang out about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was looked, I was in one of those chairs that you would be there and I'm looking at everything. And I realized that, you know, one of the, and this is all fiction folks, just to clarify, yeah. I don't talk about nonfiction. And so I'm looking at that and I realize that, you know, what brings people to books is pleasure. You know, there's some pleasure, just like if you go to a horror and everyone understands that, you know, visual is very dopamine pushing. It's a chemical in your brain um, that allows you to like stuff. And so I thought about that and I realized that, you know, the goal of, of someone to say that they liked your story is you're pushing their dopamine receptors. And that's one of the reasons, once again, we go back to the fact that, you know, three artists can have three different ways of writing a book and they're all actually accurate and inaccurate. Mm -hmm. In fact, the um, unfortunate late Dave Wolverton, he and I had a discussion and I paid consulting with him um, in order to understand because he had done, the, he was a medical, you know, kind of like pre-med. And so to understand the chemicals in the human mind and how this went about and so if you do something and if, one of the best things to do, look on your shelf, virtual or not, find your favorite three different books, look at them, reread them again and mark every single scene that you like love. There will be some scenes that you hate or you'll just skip like, Ugh, I don't like this. Find out what appeals to you in those scenes. Why did you like this? What is the emotion behind it? That's all you're doing. You're not writing a treatise on these things. You will find the dopamine receptors for you as an individual. When that happens, write your stories to those dopamine receptors. You, what, then you understand that you've created your target market. Mm -hmm. Any person that responds to your dopamine receptors is going to respond to your books. There you go. That's, that's and if you want to do it one other way, that's kind of cool. Um, understand that the authors that you've chosen are now your target market for your books, for your advertising. How's that work now? So if you go, let's say, I'm just going to use Stephen King because okay. I'm not a horror person, but he's well known. If you're going through and you find all of these things that you like and you find out that Stephen King pushes your buttons, pushes your dopamine receptors, and then because of that, you write books with these dopamine receptors in mind, not necessarily the way, you know, mimicking Stephen King. It's the fact that you like this. You now know that Stephen King is a target market for you to go on Amazon and say, I want to put my books up against Stephen King because it's ones you like, not because you're chasing whatever's popular that's going down right now. And so you're not chasing the tropes, 
You're actually finding out what causes you to be excited, writing books that make you happy, and then finding other authors that you can target to get those fans who are looking for more books, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they can read faster than that particular author can put stuff out. Sure. And now you're able to, to at least narrow, and you are the target market in marketing parlance. Wow. That's a, that's a very scientific way of analyzing and just knowing how to go after and get your, uh, and, and actually hit your target audience and know what your target audience is. There's a whole different look at that. I spent a lot of time just wondering about this stuff the last six years. <laughs> <laughs> so on, um, now I'm, I'm familiar with the Cretherian Gambit. Is that like your trademark series or do you have, for someone who wants to, I mean, I'm, I can definitely push Beth in the end. I can definitely, that's, you know, my dopamine's like mm -hmm. in, in full, in, in full excretion right now. <laughs> so talking about Beth so, in the end. Right. So the three or four major for Michael Amdeley would be Carthier and Gambit, this main series. Mm -hmm. Carthier and Gambit, the universe has 300 and something books in it, I think. I mean, it's a very significant sized universe with a lot of collaborators. Uh, or Saren is a universe that I started with Martha Carr. That's got 200 and something books in it. Um, I've got one called The Witch of the Federation, which is a, a very, is a fe another female led, and it's got a total of like 23 books in that series, in those two series. But uh, a, a fourth one for the male led is Mr. Brownstone, which is completely taken over from Guns N' Roses, Mr. Brownstone. I'm like, you know, what's a good name? I like Brownstone. But anyway, so you know, Mr. Brownstone, and that's your a little bit more typical guy with a heart of gold that gets unwrapped, you know, a little layer at each time. But otherwise, he's, you know, keep it simple, stupid type of, I do my job, I don't get, you know, and he gets embroiled and he finds out what he is, which is not normal. And that's kind of adjunct to Orisarian. It's within the Orisarian universe, but it's a little bit more down to earth and gritty, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more gritty, I would say, than, than your typical urban fantasy and very male-led. So those are the are the main ones I would suggest. Okay. So when you said that number of how many books are in there, are those are all your books? You've written those or do you, no. do you actually have other people writing in the universe as well? Yes. Yes. So, so back at the end of 2016, so one year into it, um, the fans were asking for a lot more books than I could even possibly write or wanted to write. You know, we, it's like this needed to go into post-apocalyptic and I didn't care to write post-apocalyptic. Right. I do recognize that if you write it and you write it wrong, you will get ripped apart because they're expecting you to be accurate in your guns and in your ammo and in just everything, you know, how to dig a ditch, how to, sure. you know, radioactive, all of that stuff. They're expecting, and I'm like, I'm not doing that research. <laughs> so I knew Craig Martell at the time through 20 books and I reached out to him because I knew he was a, a post apoc guy. And I said, would you be interested in joining me over here and writing this? And then I had two or three others. I, I hired a ghostwriter, so to speak, um, gave her a pen name so that she could actually, you know, build up a following. Because I asked her, I said, would you like to be paid or would you like to get a percentage of the book, which is what I'm doing with everyone else? She's like, I need to be paid. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I'm like, I, and then I would send her notes. See how much money you missed? You could have made this money if you just done this one. <laughs> but... <laughs> And it, later, she decided to do it as a uh, as a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> she got wise. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I've done all sorts of things in that way. And so, yeah, Cuthier and Gambit is mostly collaborative. And you'll see my name is second. You'll notice that a lot of times the major author is always big and bold. And the minor author is tiny at the bottom. And I don't like that. So I built it and said, if I'm not the one who's written at least 50% of this book, my name will be second, and it will never be that our names are any differently sized. They're always the same size. Mm -hmm. And so you always see that. If someone else, Candy Crumb, Michael Anderley, Candy's the one who wrote that stuff. She and I worked on it. We collaborated on concepts, but she worked through the LMVPN engine and beta fans and everything else. This has accomplished two things that I did not expect. The first one is, um, with her name first, she gets all of the credit predominantly for that series. Mm -hmm. The downside is, guess who gets the blame if the, ser if the series... I didn't recognize this. I didn't know it would happen. It's just what has happened. And so, you know, she gets the credit, but she gets the blame as well. And so where that's quote-unquote helped is if she ignores, in this example, she did not, but I'm just saying, if the author ignores the suggestions of either myself or the beta readers and say, we think you should change this. And they're like, this is what the story needs. Mm -hmm. And they go down in flames. 
they're the one who's going to go down in flames. <laughs> I guess. So now when I was researching you, you also have another pen name that you're right under. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> Are we talking about Michael Todd <laughs> or another one? Another <laughs> one. Okay. Which one is this? The, uh, I was just looking for it, uh, uh, a female. Judith Barron's? Yes. Okay. So Judith Barron's. So when you put out the quantity of books that Ellen BPN puts out, you think of it like an advanced course in publishing that is done in the matter of a few years, what takes others 20 years. If a typical author writes, let's say four books a year, which is, that's not traditional. Traditional is one time a year, maybe two, unless you're James Patterson. And that's based on traditional uh, business to business sales. We could go into that in another series. Mm -hmm. But let's say you put out four. Well, I had put out, I don't know, eight to 10 in my first year. So I was already at three years worth of knowledge. With the publishing company doing what we did, where we scaled up, you know, I'm doing one and a half years to three years of a typical, really strong sci fi publisher in one year, which means that for the smaller guys, I do. 10 years of knowledge in a year. Mm -hmm. So after six years, we've got quite a bit. We've tried a lot of things. One of the things that we were concerned with, with Martha and myself is, would one author make more sense than two? Because the theory was fans don't like collaborative books. They prefer single author books. So we put up there and built Judith Barron's over, and you'll see Michael Anderley and Martha Carr is attached to it, but it's not on the cover. And so that was a test of what's going on. Now, some of the other things that people don't realize is when you do things with Amazon and you can potentially get bonuses, which we do invariably every month, someone gets it in the company, um, they base it on the authors. So if it's, so Martha Carr is an author, Michael Anderley is an author, Martha Carr, Michael Anderley is an author, that's three. Judith Barron's with Martha Carr and Michael Anderley is four. <laughs> you know, they don't, do anything that's how they split it up and so over time we realized we were shooting ourselves in the foot not leaving it under truth you know under martha and mike so we moved it back but that was the test that we were doing is does a single author sell better than just two names right no that's a also a similar problem to what um Owen hubbard had too he wrote with 15 different pen names and quite often in the pulps he'd have two and th i've got we got some of them here of where three three of his stories were in the same pulp issue. Um, he just had he was writing hundred thousand words a month, and so mm -hmm. he just ran out of of um, magazines to write for. So he had to use different pen names in order to be able to to, to be able to sell everything that he that he was able to write to pump to put out there. See, that's an interesting aspect that uh, I'll try I'm trying to be cognizant of your time here. But that's an interesting point that people don't realize that the true pulp writers of the yesteryear. That all of the all of the fast people today that are like you can put out a book a month, they knew that 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's not that they couldn't. And get this, they did it on, if anything, old typewriters that would connect and stop. Yeah, they didn't do it on these nice word processors that change things for you. You know, it's a lot. It quote unquote lost art. It's like we're not doing anything new. We just have better tools. The, the masters had them already done. It's funny when I was when we came out. Uh, a decade ago with uh, the stories from the golden age there was 153 short stories that he had they had published when we were proofreading it we'd go through and all of a sudden it would just stop and then you'd see it start again a page earlier he would like go back if he found something that was a mistake he'd go back because you didn't have the whiteout back then he'd, he'd go back and start a page earlier and type through the mistake and so you have to catch on the proofreading then okay here's where he stopped and here's where he picked up again so he typed through the uh, the mistake, whatever it was. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, A. Van Vogt commented when he saw him writing once, he would just have the paper in his typewriter, and he'd look towards the wall, and he'd just start typing. And he'd be, he mm -hmm. had a composition speed of 94 words a minute, and he could type between 120 and 150 words a minute. So he could he would just, like, pump it out. And so Van Vogt talked about what it was like watching him create. He was just, like, the story would roll, up, what would roll before him. He'd be typing what he would you know what the story was as he was as he was creating it there mm -hmm. but anyway this has been amazing we've 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 already uh hit our hour here i, I knew this would happen so uh we'll save the other questions for some point later on time. down the road 
<laughs> so, so all million of you listeners, push John and go, can you please get Mike back on? Because I, I want to hear John get back to me. Go, hey, hey. <laughs> no worries. No worries. This, is, this has been a lot of fun. And it's, uh, it's very much along the lines of like what we do with Rise of Future. And this becomes in the next step for an aspiring writer, too, of what they can do and what they have to look forward to. And the fact that you started and became a writer, because that's one thing that's really cool, too, is some people had, I knew I was going to be a writer when I was three years old. We didn't talk about that, but you didn't. You, you had a whole no. different uh, trajectory that then switched over just from being a super fan to a super writer. Yeah, I got shut down in high school. I, I, but the short answer is I put, submitted something to the, to the, the um, catalog or, or whatever, the magazine, and it got horrible reviews, and I just shut down for the next 30 years because of it. Yeah, so um, that's something that uh, you don't get with Rise of the Future. You, the worst you're going to get is a letter saying, thank you very much, please resubmit. You know, nobody's going to, like, rain on your parade. But anyway, this has been amazingly fun, Michael. I've, I've really enjoyed this. And um, the fact that you've got hundreds of books, I don't know. This, this is a, creating a real problem for me right now. This, <laughs> I have so many books I need to read to keep up with, uh, with the guests. But I'm now I'm totally addicted to uh, the Cretherian Gambit. So I thank you for that. Good. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Yes. And thank you for listening. Subscribe to the Writers and Illustrators of the Future podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We've also been syndicated on the United Public Radio Network where you can find these podcasts as well. Writers and Illustrators of the Future are contests created by Owen Hubbard to provide a means for the aspiring writer and artist to be seen and acknowledged. It is free to enter and open to amateur short story writers and artists of science fiction or fantasy. Also, the books, Writers of the Future, are available in bookstores, online, and wherever you get your books. Again, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael.